formal opening. Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. So happy to see you all here tonight. The club, as we say, is the place when you're in the know. Uh, and uh, tonight we have some wonderful folks here to bring you in the know about a wonderful career, a wonderful life, and some very important issues. You can, of course, find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Gloria Duffy, as most of you know, president and CEO of the club, and I will, with great pleasure and honor, moderate this evening's program. Today's program is part of the club's Good Lit series. Dr. Perry's uh, autobiography is definitely good lit, good literature. Uh, our underwriter for this is the Bernard Osher Foundation. Tonight's program features Dr. William Perry, who served as Secretary of Defense under President Clinton, and he is the author of a new memoir, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink. We're going to have a little bit of an unusual format this evening. Dr. Perry will speak for a few minutes, followed by Robin Perry, director of the William Perry Project, which is aimed at educating the public and particularly young people on the dangers of nuclear weapons in the 21st century. We will then have a conversational question period with both of them. And so, of course, we encourage you to write question cards and send them up so uh, both Secretary Perry and Robin Perry can answer them. Now, tonight we're be going to be discussing the life of Dr. Perry and an autobiography. So I think the worst thing I could do is repeat that entire autobiography in an introduction. Uh, I will, however, uh, provide a brief introduction of someone who truly does need no introduction. Dr. Perry's career spans many fields including engineering, mathematics, national security, and business management. His roles have ranged from being the director of the Electronic Defense Laboratories of Sylvania GTE in his early career, to founding a Silicon Valley company and running it, uh, ESL Corporation, Electromagnetic Systems Laboratory. He's been and currently still is a Stanford professor and he has, of course, had multiple roles in leadership of American defense policy. These have included the roles of Under Secretary of Defense, Depu Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Secretary of Defense. I want to tell you just a little bit about Dr. Perry's educational background and about his awards, and he's going to tell you about his episodes of his career and what he's drawn from those experiences. Dr. Perry uh, has received some of the most uh, distinguished awards in the world. He's received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1997. He is a Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire, so he's actually Sir Bill in 1998. And he's received the Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun in 2002, awarded by the Emperor of Japan. Dr. Perry received his BS in 1949 and his MA in 1950, uh, degrees from Stanford, and a PhD in mathematics from Pennsylvania State University in 1957. He currently serves as the Michael and Barbara Berberian Professor Emeritus at Stanford University. He has a joint appointment at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the School of Engineering. He's a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, and he serves as co-director of the Nuclear Risk Reduction Initiative and the Preventive Defense Project. In closing of this very brief overview of Dr. Perry's biography, uh, I had the pleasure of serving under Dr. Perry at the Department of Defense. And what I observed there, and many people have observed, he has drawn on such a wide uh, experience and expertise in his career in defense leadership. He was a terrific business manager, having had business management experience in Silicon Valley. He was a uh, terrific expert and scholar uh, having been a scholar and expert, he understood the technical side of everything, being a mathematician and an engineer. I don't believe there has ever been a Secretary of Defense with such wide expertise and such great and effective leadership. So I am very happy to introduce my friend, mentor, 
colleague and uh, one of the people I most respect in the world, Dr. William Perry. Thank you very much, Gloria. I was just 17 when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. A few months later, I turned 18, joined the Army, and became part of the Army of Occupation in Japan. Nothing, nothing had prepared me for the devastation that I saw in Tokyo. All of the wooden buildings were totally destroyed. The concrete buildings were badly damaged. The survivors were living in rubble. The damage in Tokyo, in some ways, is comparable to that in Hiroshima. But there was one huge difference. The destruction of Tokyo took two years. Huge fleets of bombers tens of thousands of bombs. The destruction of Hiroshima happened in an instant. One airplane, one bomb. Just one bomb. Einstein has said that the atomic bomb has changed everything. Everything except the way we think. But this experience did begin to change my way of thinking even at the tender age of 18. Indeed, this experience was the beginning of my journey at the nuclear brink. The next milestone of my journey occurred in 1962, when I was the director of Electronic Defense Laboratory in Mountain View, California. I was also a pro bono scientific consultant to the Secretary of Defense and the, C and the director of CIA. And I'm one day in Fall day in 1962, I received a phone call from the deputy director of CIA asking me if I would come back to consult with him on a very important problem. And I said, sure, I'll rearrange my schedule and I'll fly back over the weekend and see you on Monday. He said, no, you don't understand. I want to see you right away. So I got on the red eye and flew back to Washington and the next morning, I went into his office, and to my amazement, he showed me pictures of nuclear missiles being deployed in Cuba. And that was my first introduction to what came to be called the Cuban Missile Crisis. <clears throat> For the next eight days, I worked almost around the clock. Every morning, we would get pictures and data being collected on Cuba that day, and a small team of three or four photo interpreters and three or four scientists like myself would study those data, and by about midnight, we would have a report written about what it all meant, and that report would be on the desk of President Kennedy the next morning to help guide his thinking that day. Every day I went to that analysis center, I believed would be my last day on Earth. And to this day, I believe that we survived a nuclear catastrophe as much by good luck as by good management. And every book that I've written about it and since then has only strengthened that judgment. <clears throat> the third milestone of my journey occurred in 1978 when I was the Under Secretary of Defense. And again, I received a phone call, this time at 3 o'clock in the morning from the watch officer of the North American Air Defense Command. The general got right to the point. He told me his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. And for one horrible moment, I believed we were about to suffer the catastrophe that we had somehow avoided during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was, of course, a false alarm. And happily, the general had recognized it as such. He was calling me to figure out what the hell had happened to his computers so that he had an answer when he gave it the next day to the Secretary of Defense. We, I, I was, by the way, I was not able to answer his question on the phone that night. It took us two days of intensive analysis 
to figure out what had happened, which was a sergeant, instead of putting in the operating tape in the computer, put in a training tape. <laughs> of course, it was designed to look quite realistic. So it was a scary moment. That false alarm, had it not been recognized as such, could very well have led to the end of our civilization. There were three false alarms that I personally know about in the United States, and I don't know how many there might have been in the Soviet Union. The fourth milestone of my journey occurred when I was the Secretary of Defense. The Soviet Union had by now dissolved, and the nuclear weapons that they'd had had devolved into four different of the new republics. Besides Russia, there was Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. The last three of these had no experience at all in maintaining and controlling nuclear weapons. And each of those countries was going through a profound period of chaos, economic, political, and social chaos. We called that the loose nukes problem. This nu loose nukes problem was one our planners had never envisioned, so we just had to improvise. And as Secretary of Defense, I made it my top priority to deal with that problem. And what, we've, what we evolved as a solution to it was we had to simply dismantle all of the weapons in Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. There were 4,000, 4,000 nuclear weapons. We, our goal, myself and Dr. Carter, who was my deputy for this problem, now, by the way, the Secretary of Defense. Our solution was to <clears throat> was use the so-called non-Lugar program as a vehicle for the Secretary of Defense to have the authority to dismantle all of those weapons. Of course, we also have a lot of diplomacy to get the Russians, Ukrainians, the Belarus, and the Kazakhstan to agree to that. Fortunately, we did all that, and, in the, and the, already in the President Clinton's first term, we got all 4,000 of those weapons dismantled along with 4,000 American weapons, nuclear weapons. So altogether, we dismantled 8,000 nuclear bombs and converted the fissile material in those bombs to fuel for our nuclear reactors. This is a modern day version of converting swords to plowshares. I thought at the time that we were well on our way to dealing with the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War but that was not to be. After I left office, the dismantlement efforts slowed down and then finally stopped, with tens of thousands of bombs still in existence. So that led to the fifth milestone on my journey. That was in 2007, when I joined forces with George Schultz, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, and we wrote several articles in the Wall Street Journal, whose point was, explaining to the world the danger the nuclear weapons pose today, arguing that we should work for their complete elimination, and in the meantime, we should take a series of steps which we outlined to reduce the, the danger they pose to us. The high point of our efforts occurred in February of 2009 when President Obama made his famous Prague speech. I state clearly and with conviction, he said, the commitment of the United States to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. For me, those were golden days. But alas, they could not be sustained. Today, there's still about 20,000, 20,000 nuclear weapons in the world. We are faced with the danger of nuclear terrorism. We are faced with the prospect of a regional nuclear war. And we are on the brink of a new nuclear arms race between the United States and Russia. The danger of a nuclear catastrophe today is greater than it was during the Cold War. Let me repeat that. I feel very strongly on this point. The danger of a nuclear war today is greater than it was during the Cold War. And our policies are simply not compatible with those dangers. I believe this is because our public is blissfully unaware of the dangers. And so I'm dedicating my efforts to the task of educating the public on this issue so that we can have a better chance of making intelligent decisions about it. My first effort is this book, 
which has just been published. In my book, I take my readers on the journey of some of the incidents I've just described to you in hopes that they may experience vicariously the events that shaped my thinking. But I recognize that such a book will reach a small and select audience. Maybe this is the small and select audience I'm thinking of. <laughs> and particularly, particularly will not reach many of our youth, although I'm happy to see a few of our youth here today. Three years ago, I formed a small project for that purpose. And the director of this project, Robin Perry, who's already been introduced to you, will follow me and tell you something about our project. Now, I know this talk is a downer, but I want to end it on an upbeat tone. I have often been told that I'm being hopelessly idealistic pursuing the elimination of nuclear weapons. In response, I quote Andrei Sakharov, who worked tirelessly for political reform in the Soviet Union. He said, there is a need to create ideals even when you cannot see any route to achieve them. Because if there are no ideals, then there can be no hope. I've also been asked why, at my age, I continue to work on this seemingly hopeless problem instead of, instead of settling down in that Garden of Eden known as Palo Alto <laughs> to, to enjoy a life of retirement. In response to them, I quote, Robert F Frost. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you. Dr. Duffy, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, it's a real honor and uh, an opportunity. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, there's no coincidence that my last name is the same. That's my father. And it's just been such a privilege to spend the last two or three years working with him first on the book and then on the project and the educational portion of our project. Um, He's quite the inspiration, as you can imagine. Um, the Perry Project began with the memoir, as he pointed out, and the overall goal that we've come up with is to reach a younger generation with the message of nuclear danger. But will they read the book? Probably not. And why are we focusing on millennials? Um, a lot of people are trying to get their advertising dollars, we know that. We're focusing on them because there's very little awareness about nuclear danger in this generation coming up. They did not grow up in the Cold War and hear about the danger on a daily basis. Uh, once the Cold War ended, many, many people have been born since then who really don't know much about it at all. And they are the ones who will bear the cost and the risk of nuclear policy that is being decided today. To have a real voice in any influence, they really must be informed. This is a very complex issue. And they must be engaged in a public conversation about the purpose of nuclear weapons in the 21st century. So how to engage them? I'm clearly not a millennial, so we had to ask them. We convened a group of students from three universities, and we asked them to consider this question, why isn't the issue of nuclear danger on the radar of their peers? What they discovered in their research, we sort of sent them off for two months. They researched from various parts of the country independently and then met together periodically. What they discovered in their research, I mean, there is plenty of information out there about these issues, but it's just not reaching them. They told us, millennials access and consume information differently. They're 
mobile-centric, on smaller devices and screens, their preference for video and short-form storytelling to get their information, on-the-go viewing anywhere, anytime, standing online somewhere in the most informal of ways. They like to share what they learn through their social networks. They like to create that sense of community around sharing that information. And they like to take action, and they like to engage with content in many small ways, something as simple as clicking like, something more complex, writing a response to a blog. And they often create their own content. This is a remarkably facile, creative generation with many tools at their disposal, and they aren't afraid to use them, unlike older generations that spend a lot of time worrying about the exact editing of the word and freezing themselves in the process. <laughs> they get their news from a variety of media-rich sites, most with a popular culture styling with tools for engaging. Things like BuzzFeed, Vice News, Algeria, Al Jazeera Plus, I'm sure you've seen them. Um, they're everywhere and they're springing up all the time. So they're not going to just the same old sources to get information and news. So we began designing uh, an online education program with short form courses that would incorporate many of these tools and ideas, which we are continuing to work on. And at the same time, we invited a small group the next summer of young professionals to work with us, and this was just this last summer, to create their own content about these issues. Our aim was to get content with a younger sensibility. Uh, we acted only as advisors, giving feedback and opening doors to experts when they needed them. We requested a variety of uh, media projects to just illustrate the different types of content, not just video, but interactive graphics, data charts, and encourage them to use alternative styles of conveying the information. This is a very small team. There were just three of them. And the results are posted now on the homepage of the Perry Project website, which is wjperryproject.org. Check it out when you have a minute. We believe these examples could serve as a prototype for engaging more young people in these issues going forward from here. And the one example I will show you today depicts the nightmare scenario, which is in the preface of my journey at the nuclear brink. It's pretty grim, but it is intended to start a public conversation that we desperately need to have. Buried deep under these bone-dry high plains, in a covert section of a massively hardened centrifuge facility, a team is hard at work. They are members of a breakaway faction of the country's security forces, and they are busy enriching 40 kilograms of uranium. By July 3rd, they achieve their target of 90% enrichment and then transfer the uranium to a nearby secret lab, where another team of technicians assembles it into a crude nuclear bomb. On August 31, they finish their work. They put the bomb in a packing crate labeled agricultural equipment and transport it to a nearby airfield where it is stored in a warehouse. Two weeks later, it is removed and loaded onto an aircraft with civilian air cargo markets. It flies to Dubai, where the crate is transferred, along with other goods and equipment, to a global air transport freighter. Destination, Washington, D.C. The plane lands at Washington's Dulles International Airport at 2.47 a.m. on September the 15th. By late afternoon, 
The crate is delivered to a warehouse in the southeast part of the district. Then, before daybreak, on September the 17th, the bomb is removed from the crate and loaded onto a delivery truck. Several hours later, an American citizen eases the truck out into traffic. She drives it to a location on Pennsylvania Avenue, midway between the White House and the Capitol building. At 11.09 a.m., she stops in the middle of traffic, climbs down onto the street, and triggers the detonator. The bomb explodes with a power of 15 kilotons. There are more than 80,000 instant deaths, including the president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, and the 320 members of Congress present when the bomb goes off. There are also more than 100,000 seriously wounded and virtually no place to treat them. Telecommunication facilities throughout the greater Washington area have gone down. Soon, cable news is broadcasting scenes of vast devastation from the Capitol. A short time later, all major news outlets report receiving an identical message. The message claims that five more bombs are hidden in five different cities across the country. It says one of these bombs will be set off each week for the next five weeks, unless all American troops based overseas are ordered to return immediately to the U.S. homeland. The nation is hurled into panic. Everything begins shutting down. Within a half hour, the stock market drops more than 70% before trading is halted. From coast to coast, masses of people begin to stream out of cities, no matter their size or location. There is widespread gridlock. Cell phone systems are soon overwhelmed and calls cannot go through. Internet access is impossible in many regions, and the nation is now in a constitutional crisis. By succession, the Senate President Pro Tem is now the country's president. But he is being treated for pancreatic cancer far from the Capitol at the Mayo Clinic. The Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, both of whom were testifying to the House Armed Services Committee on their recent budget request, are dead as well. Martial law is declared in Washington and surrounding regions, and the next day, the entire country. There is widespread looting and violence in many cities. Federal and National Guard troops are mustered. Soon there are reports of troops firing on crowds. There are increasing numbers of reports of rioting against immigrants and foreigners. Within days, the military begins to construct large detention centers around the country. Dr. William Perry for his opening remarks, and Robin Perry, and thank you for sharing with us this very sobering vision. Um, not, it's not a uh, happy vision, but as it said on the screen, it is based on facts, and the facts are put together in a worst case scenario, but it is something that could happen. So I think it's a good place to start our discussion. We have many questions from you. We won't dwell entirely on this, but I thought that this was something that uh, is so dramatic and so persuasive uh, that we should share it with you and, and have it as a uh, stimulus to our discussion. Could you tell us both why you decided to make this film, who the audience is for it, and what you hope to come from it? What do you hope to stimulate? Awareness. We hope that 
it makes people sit up and pay attention. It's a very graphic description of something unimaginable. And we think people need to imagine it before they're going to take action to ensure that it doesn't happen. Dr. Perry, any comments about your nightmare vision? Think of all of the ways, of, think of all of the ways that a nuclear catastrophe might happen in the next few years. A nuclear terror incident like the one we've just described here is the most likely. And it's one which we, nobody thinks about really. Most important is one we have not taken preventive actions. The single most significant thing we could do to reduce the probability of that kind of an incident is get better control over the fissile material around the world. Uh, I don't believe a nuclear terror group could build a nuclear bomb from scratch. But if they could get the fissile material, then they could. And in that regard, the President's initiative of what he calls the nuclear summit to bring nations in from all over the world to pledge better means of, of safeguarding fissile material is a very important step. I think that's the most significant thing we have done of recent to, to really minimize the probability of such a scenario. But he's sort of alone on that. He's getting very little support, very little interest in the country for what he's doing. It's a bucket of cold water in the face. But I think you have to get people's attention before they start thinking seriously about the problem and what they need to do about it. This is not an unrealistic scenario that was laid out. So could you, if you could put a name to any of the countries or groups where that location might have been, uh, where those scientists were putting together the weapon, who would be, who or what groups would be on that list? <clears throat> well, both Iran and North Korea, of course, have programs where they're making fissile material. They have the capability to do that. So they would be two possible candidates. But they're making fissile material in Russia, too. They're, um, they're making fissile material in Pakistan and in India. So any of those countries are candidates for an, uh, <clears throat> where the front end of that scenario could take place. Is ISIS a candidate? ISIS, a non-state actor uh, based in Syria, based in Iraq, without governmental control of mm -hmm. either of those uh, countries, uh, but a, a group that operates in several different areas and countries, would they be a candidate for this type of threat? Uh, yes, but they have to get access to the fissile material. No non-state actor that I know of has the capability of making the fissile material, and you cannot make a bomb without the fissile material. So in this scenario, we focused on the, how they got a hold of the fissile material. Once they had it, it was relatively straightforward to make what we call an improvised nuclear bomb. Do not be misled by the word improvised. It has to do with the form factor of the bomb. It's big and bulky. It has to go in a truck instead of a warhead. It has nothing to do with the bang with which it goes off. The bomb we envisioned here was a 15 kiloton bomb, the same as the Hiroshima bomb. Let's uh, switch to current day challenges, uh, challenges we, we know. Uh, there are a number of questions from the audience about North Korea. Was it a hydrogen bomb? What's going on? What should we do about it? Should there be more six-party talks? What, what, are, what are we to do about the North Koreans? Uh, let me first of all say that I wrote an article trying to answer those questions. It was uh, uh, published online two days ago by Politico. So I can refer you to the Politico for a more detailed answer to that question. But a short answer to some of the questions is no, it was not a hydrogen bomb, as we define a hydrogen bomb, which is a two-stage fission fusion reaction. I do not believe that at all. Um, what I believe it was, however, is it worrisome enough. I believe it was an attempt to make smaller and more compact the bomb they'd already developed. So it had maybe only a yield of 10 kilotons, uh, which is a little 
a little smaller than Hiroshima bomb, but about the same. But if they can put that into a missile warhead, it becomes very frightening. They have several hundred missiles capable of reaching South Korea, Japan, and other countries in the region. And if they had a bomb small enough to go in those missiles, they would become very formidable indeed. So I think what it was was an attempt to further develop the bomb they've already tested into a f size and form factor that's suitable for a, a nuclear warhead on a medium range missile. So we have a few millennials in the audience and we have a couple questions. Uh, one, uh, as a fellow millennial, what is the best way in your opinion not only to bring this subject to our attention but to actually inspire action when many feel our future is already dismal with global warming, terrorism, and many other serious issues today? Robin, and either, either of you. Well, there are many issues which occupy the attention of all of us. Only two of them are what I would call existential. Existential meaning our very existence is threatened by them. One of them is the nuclear bomb issue, which I've been talking about, and the other is a, a global, cli global climate change. The difference between those two is not in the ultimate outcome, but in the fact that the nuclear issue is here and now. It could, we could have a, a catastrophe like depicted in that cartoon we just showed you this year and next year, whereas the global warming is going to take several decades to really materialize. But both of them are existential and I believe should have equal priority in our thinking about what we should be doing. Uh, one other difference is because the global climate change has so long to develop, we have more time to do something about it. S some scientists fear they've already passed the, the uh, point of no return. I don't think that is true. But in any event, we, even if we can't completely stop it, we can at least diminish it, and we should be doing that. So those are the two big existential issues in life. We all have many other problems we have to worry about day in and day out, but those two ought to be very at the very top of our list. Robin? Uh, I think I, I can only speak from a sense that we are a democracy. We have the opportunity to get involved in these issues. I think many people in the nuclear issues feel that it's not their domain, not their right. Somebody else is taking care of that. Some expert out there is making us safe and protecting the stockpile of nuclear weapons, and we shouldn't have to worry about it. And I, all I would say, this, this is a democracy. People do need to get involved in these issues and bring a sense of optimism that you can make a change. It's very incremental, and it, a lot of people in the nuclear field work their way up for many years before they are making a difference. But there are public debates beginning right now about the modernization of the nuclear force. Learn about it understand it and talk to the people who represent you in Congress about what your feelings are about it. That's one small way to engage in this issue as a millennial, as any age, um, and where you can make a difference. Glory, let me bring just one issue up <clears throat> to follow on with what Robin was saying. One issue <clears throat> which we're going to be we're faced with today and it's a big issue related to this problem, and yet most of our citizens understand nothing about it. And that is we are on the verge of beginning a new nuclear arms race, like we did in the Cold War. Uh, Russia has already proceeded with the development of, of whole new generations of ICBMs, SLBMs, the whole panoply of uh, nuclear carriers and nuclear weapons, and I, Myself, expect that their, part of their plan is to actually break the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and start testing new, new nuclear weapons. It will be easy for them to, to rationalize this because the United States, to its great shame, has never ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So if that's underway. I have no doubt that the United, there'll be huge pressure in the United States to follow suit. We have, on the books, actually, 
the plan for so-called recapitalizing our nuclear forces, which over a 30-year period is estimated to cost about a trillion dollars. Now, that's a number that's so big you cannot relate to it. But believe me, it's a lot of money. Even on a year-to-year -year basis, it's a lot of money. It, it's, uh, you can think of many, many alternatives you would, ways you would like to spend that money, even if you're only defense-oriented. You can think of conventional weapons you'd rather spend it on than nuclear weapons. But we're on the verge of that, and there's no public discussion of it at all. So that's something that we ought to do something about right away. So we'll come back to this at the end of our time, but let's talk a little bit more about your life and how you got to where you are and the various uh, issues and causes that you have pursued. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, about growing up, and uh, how did your interest, for instance, in math and engineering get sparked? I, I will say right now that while this book I wrote as a memoir, it does not answer any of those questions. That's why I'm asking I you now. I don't really just, my, for example, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister never appear in the book. Uh, the book starts as I started my talk here when I was 17 years old and went into the Army. It starts with my experiences which shaped my thinking about nuclear weapons. Now, I deviate from that rule some, and then when I, talk, when I talk about the period I was Secretary of Defense, I talk about things other than nuclear weapons. But by and large, it's a book about experiences that shaped my thinking on nuclear weapons. Uh, I grew up in a small town, lower middle income family. Uh, soon discovered the thing I liked to do in school was mathematics. Uh, and ended up majoring, getting a PhD in mathematics. Why? Because I, I liked it, was good at it, and, and secondly, because I liked to teach. And so I ended up thinking I was going to be a university professor in mathematics. A funny thing happened on the way to becoming a math professor, which was in my last, which I got married, and we had two children when I started graduate school. And then in my second year of graduate school, Robin and her twin sister Rebecca were born. So we now had four children, no independent source of income, and my GI Bill just run out. So I had to get a part-time job, and the part-time job I got was teaching at a defense electronics company. I found out I liked that too, and did, was good at it, and I deviated my career away from a mathematics professor into what I am today. That's a short answer. When did your first it's call... Robin's fault. When... <laughs> When did your first call to public service come? Pardon me? When did your first call to public service come? Here you were in Silicon yeah. Valley, you were in the electronics industry. How well, did you first go uh, to Washington and get involved in I had, policy? I uh, had worked for 10 years at the, uh, the big company, Sylvania's uh, GT&E's laboratory in Mountain View, and decided I could, didn't need their help to do what they were doing. So I left that company and formed my own company. I was an entrepreneur, as they call it today, until, although I didn't know what I was at the time. <laughs> <clears throat> and at the time, nowadays, if, if a graduate, if a person leaves Stanford and, and doesn't start a new company, they figure something's wrong with them. But then, everybody thought there was something wrong with me for leaving a good, secure job to start my own company. Anyway, we did. And it became very successful. And after 13 years of doing that, I got one of these phone calls that I got. This one from Harold Brown, who was then the Secretary of Defense, asking me to come back and run research and engineering for the Defense Department. And I said, no, that was that. I'm not gonna leave my company, I'm not gonna leave Palo Alto, I'm not gonna, I love this place, I love, I'm not gonna go. So a week later, I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up, and it ended up being the right answer. I'm glad I did it, it was, it was the most interesting, interesting job a technical person could have. You had $100 billion a year to spend on all the technical toys you could think of. And it was a great, we developed a stealth airplane during that period. We developed the GPS, not for putting in your car, but for putting in military vehicles. We developed uh, internet. All of that was done in about a four year period. It was a very, very exciting time, technically. And then I left that job and was later on called to be back again 12 years later to be the First step in the secretary, I said no to that one too. And a week later, I said yes. 
So I'm, I'm, all I'm demonstrating to you is I'm, I'm an easy mark. So in each case, what changed no to yes a week later? Pardon? In each case, what changed no to yes in your mind? In the first case, that was way back in 1977, people were talking about a window of vulnerability. They were talking about we were they seriously believing that the Soviet Union was going to start a war with us. And they had an army three times the size of ours. And it didn't make economic sense to try to match them in size. And so the president and then the then Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, wanted a, what they called an offset strategy. They wanted us to use our technology to offset the quantitative advantage that the Soviets had. That's what, that, I have to say that appealed to me both as a as a worthy political aim and as a challenge, an interesting, challenging technical problem. That's when we developed the stealth airplane and the GPS and you know, all those good, good things. Uh, and the second time, I said no. Really, the thing that persuaded me was almost the direct opposite of that one. It was that I had worked very hard with Senator Nunn and Senator Lugar to get this program approved for dismantling these weapons in Ukraine and Bar Kazakhstan and Belarus. <coughs> And that had been in 1992, and now here we were in 1993. We had an opportunity to do it, and the, the Nunn and Lugar program gave the authority to do it to the Secretary of Defense. So Nunn and Lugar said to me, You helped us put this program together. How can you not, how can you turn down the responsibility to do it? <laughs> so we did. And I had an amazing, amazing team to do it. Ash Carter was the head of that team, now the Secretary of Defense. Gloria Duffy was a key on that team. Liz Sherwood, who's now the Deputy Secretary of Energy, was on that team. We had a whole team of people, mostly women, by the way, who spoke Russian, were very, very smart, and were very good organizers and managers. And we got 8,000, I said, 8,000 nuclear weapons dismantled in three years. It's an incredible job. The diplomatic and the technical parts of it were all very challenging. I'll just point out that the turning no into yes happened it is a theme in his book. There were several occasions, and you'll get more detail if you re read the book. You must read the book, yes. <laughs> so I don't mean this to be an awkward question, but it's one that interests me. You were a major force, given your very strong technical background and uh, management background in the development of weapon systems, the stealth family of uh, systems. You have also been an incredible peacemaker, as it were, dismantling weapons and uh, bringing the US and other countries closer together to collaborate and so on. Are you equally proud of developing weapon systems and defense systems and your contributions in the uh, area of dismantling weapons? Uh, what's, what's the balance there? Well, I always believed in both in both cases that what I was doing was intended to preserve the peace. And weapons we were developing were developing not to start a war, but to de deter a war. And in the 1970s, I thought that was essential. I think we overstated the problem. I think in, 19, in the 70s, we believed that the Soviet Union was consciously planning to attack us. In retrospect, I do not believe that is correct. It was true, I think, during Stalin's area, but it, but it was not true after that. So we learned a lesson from Stalin, and then we never unlearned that lesson when he was when he had su successors. Um, but, but as I said, I believed what we were doing there was to keep the peace. After the Cold War was over, I saw no rationale to keep these dangerous weapons around, and ever since then, I've been working on trying to get them dismantled. But uh, some people get attached to one particular weapon system, you can't let it go. There's a lot of resistance to reducing these weapons today. As I said, I fully expect we will start a new cycle of rebuilding, recapitalizing, as they say, all of these weapons that we built during the Cold War. I think that's a huge mistake. We actually have several questions about that particular topic. Regarding U.S. policy to revamp our nuclear arsenals with a new generation of nuclear weapons through the next three decades and beyond, who inside and outside government is driving this policy? Uh, to whom are they answerable? 
And then there are several other questions about the wisdom of that policy and what should we do and not do in modernizing our nuclear weapons. Well, what is absolutely clear is that they are answerable to you if you choose to speak up. If, and you can't speak up until you learn what the issues are. So you have to educate yourself and then you have to be active. It's no good being active if you don't know what the hell you're talking about. So you first of all have to educate yourself on it. And that's why what we're embarked on now is a program of education. I say it's directed mostly at young people, but old people can do it too. <laughs> you're allowed to read, what we, you're allowed to see our movies and you're allowed to read our books and so on. And I urge you to do that. Another question about your role at the Defense Department. In what sense does a political appointee provide leadership to the career military personnel in the Department of Defense? What's the nature of civilian leadership? It's, it's believed by many people that government is incapable of acting and the political appointees have very little power. And that's just not true. Uh, I gave you the example of three years of dismantling 8,000 nuclear weapons, for example. That was huge diplomatic effort, a huge technical effort, huge fiscal problem. Uh, but I found the Secretary of Defense, when I was determined to do something, there wasn't anybody could stop me except the president. So if I had the president's backing, I could do it. Uh, you have to deal with the Congress, of course, but that's not always easy. But there is an enormous power in the positions if a person is willing to just take that power and take that responsibility and, and act on it. The downside of that is if you make a mistake, if you do something wrong, you're really hanging out there. But if you don't, but I, wasn't a, I was not a career politician. I was in for one term, as I saw it. I was going to do everything I could do in that one term to achieve what I wanted to do and, and let the chips fly where they may. So for a career politician, that's not so easy. But for a person who's in for one term, you decide to do it, you can do it. Please share your hope for improving U.S. relations with Russia. U.S. Russian relations today are about as bad as they were during the Cold War. I hate to say that, but that's, I truly believe it. That the cause for that is almost equally with the United States and Russia. Putin is a very hard person to deal with. He's not an admirable person. He's an autocrat. He's probably a kleptocrat, too. There are a lot of bad things you can say about him, but he is the president of Russia, and Russia has more than 10,000 nuclear weapons. We have to pay attention. As Willie Lohman said, you know, attention must be paid. And we are disrespecting them, and that's the one thing the, the Russian leaders really, really hate. So we have to get over that and face them on equal terms in terms of our nuclear forces and work together to try to decrease this danger, which is not just to us and not just to them, it's to the whole world. And we have a responsibility to face this problem and do something about it. And the first thing we have to do is, before we can have any success with Russia on dealing with these nuclear weapons, we have to get a civil dialogue going between our two presidents, which we don't have today. Uh, don't expect me to say anything good about Vladimir Putin. I have no regard for him at all. But I do have regard and respect for the president of Russia, which he is, and we have to deal with that. We have to deal with the president of Russia. I think uh, Secretary Kerry realizes that and is working hard with his counterpart, the Foreign Minister Lavrov, in Russia. But we have gone downhill in relation with Russia substantially in the last four or five years, and, it's, and it's, it's creating a danger to all of us, I think. We had an interesting discussion here a few weeks ago with uh, Steve Cohen. Oh, excuse me. One other thing I might say about that. I have a whole section of my book about what happened, why, our, why the Russian, U.S. Russian relations went downhill in the last 10 years. I, and I started off, I've, it, I, the first downhill step was when we decided to enlarge NATO which I opposed strongly at the time. I, I asked President Clinton to call a special ca cabinet meeting so I could make, make my case, and I did, but I failed. 
and so we went ahead and enlarged NATO, and that was one of the one of the to me one of the one of the uh, beginning of the slip going down the slippery slope. So Steve Cohen is a uh, expert on Russia and the former Soviet Union. He's a bit of a contrarian. He's on the faculty at NYU now. And he's been arguing for a number of years that we were making a mistake to slant towards Ukraine and to not uh, continue to develop our relationship with Russia. He believes in the old theory that we have common interests even uh, in collaborating on certain issues, even if we don't approve of their internal politics, human rights, et cetera. The discussion at that meeting went along the lines of uh, combating ISIS is going to bring the US and Russia together. We have a natural common interest, and Russia is in some way leading the way in taking steps to against ISIS, especially in Syria and Iraq. Do you feel that there's uh, going to be a rapprochement with Russia over the issue of joining together to fight ISIS? I hope and I believe that we will find a common cause with Russia on issues in which we really have a common cause, a common policy on issues which we have a common cause. One of those is fighting ISIS, but high on my list is, the, is the dealing with the nuclear issue, reducing the, reducing, getting back to our program of reducing our nuclear arms through arms control treaties, getting ourselves, getting back to reaffirming the, the test ban treaty, and certainly cooperating and working to prevent a nuclear terror, a scenario like we presented to you on the board here. U.S., that bomb which we had going off in Washington, D.C. might just as well have gone off in Moscow. Moscow is equally susceptible to nuclear terrorism as we are. In fact, in some ways, more, more susceptible. So we ought to find a common cause on those issues which are most important to us. Even if we have to hold our nose while we're negotiating with them, we should do it. This problem is just so important. During the depth of the Cold Wars, we were negotiating with Russian presidents who were certainly not admirable people and who had policies which we could not support at all. But we understood that the overarching danger of a nuclear catas catastrophe caused us to get together and try to reach common cause. I think uh, another... Uh, piece of the book that comes out a lot is the role of track two dialogues in the process of finding common ground with countries that we have such major disagreements with. And he speaks a lot about different track two dialogues um, throughout his career in, when, in between his positions in government. When you're in government, you're the official, you're in track one, you are dealing directly with the other government officials, when you're out of government, there are other informal conversations and dialogues that take place that inform the official process. And it's I found it fascinating. I didn't know anything about that before I started working with him on this book. So I think um, that's another area of the book that you might find quite interesting. I had, during the uh, three, four, five years ago, I was concerned with the Iranian nuclear program I worked at track two meetings. I met two times with the foreign minister of Iran and two times with the national security advisor in Washington, in Geneva, and The Hague, various places, trying to find a common ground for negotiating an agreement by which they would verifiably stop their nuclear weapon program. Um, I did that when our government was not involved. I mean, was letting the, letting the uh, really take no significant action. As soon as President Obama and Secretary Kerry decided to pick up the ball and start running with it, then I dropped my track to there's no need to do it. They ended up talking with the same people I had been talking with, but were now from an official position. And they ended up with an agreement which is a better agreement than I thought we, were, we would be able to get, and, and one which I have strongly supported. But the, the, the track two person in the United States and the track two person in Iran are trying to find a, an agreement common cause which they can agree to, and then each one of them takes it to his own leader and tries to get them to support it. And so you only need track two when the track one isn't working very well. Do you see and on the Iran agreement, do you see any positive outcomes, uh, any 
uh, that have emerged from our having reached that agreement with Iran? Do you see anything uh, improving in U.S.-Iranian relations more generally? Well, the, just the nuclear part of it alone, I think, has been very significant. As I said, went farther, much farther reaching than I'd expected it to, to be able to go. But I think there is at least a possibility we get that problem off the table, that we might be able to reach a, a civil dialogue and discussion, maybe even a recognition of the two governments and embassies in each country. Um, I've visited several times in Iran. Um, the people are lovely there. It's, it's, just, it's just a great country to visit. They love Americans. In spite of all the propaganda they're hearing from the government, they love Americans. And um, I just want to give you one answer. This is a true story. When I was in uh, uh, Iran, we were visiting some beautiful mosque, the Blue Mosque, it's called. And I came out first from the group I was with. I was standing there waiting, and an Iranian came over to talk with me, a young man, of, I'd say maybe 30, in his early 30s. And he asked me if I was an American, and I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have helped to deny it, so I said, yes, I am. And he said, do you know Condi Rice? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, I do. <laughs> and he said, is she married? <laughs> I, I couldn't wait to get back from the trip to tell Condi that story. <laughs> this is a true story, no embellishment. Did you take a phone number for her? <laughs> you know, as I see our consuls general from uh, Japan here frequently over the years, they hold you in such high respect in Japan. Can you talk about some of your uh, relationship with Japan? Uh, I know you negotiated a new agreement over Okinawa, and you have you had, during your time as Secretary of Defense, you had quite a bit of uh, activities with Japan. I had, I worked pretty intensively to develop good relations with Japan when I was Secretary of Defense. But subsequent to being Secretary of Defense, um, my last year, Secretary of Defense, was 97. Uh, in 99, we had some big crisis. One of our one of our crises was North Korea, and Bill Clinton asked me if I would come back temporarily to government as a uh, and be his envoy to, to work out a North Korea new North Korea policy. And so I put together a small team. Ash Carter was on that team. Philip Yoon, who's sitting right in front of me, was on that team. And we, uh, but the first thing we did. I said, we can't deal with this problem by ourselves. This is a problem that equally involves, at least equally, Japan and South Korea. So I told the president I wanted a tripartite group. So I got, we got the president of South Korea and the, and the prime minister of Japan to appoint counterparts to myself. And I met with them. It was remarkable because the first meeting I had with the three of them we couldn't have three, three sided meetings. I had to meet with the Japanese, and then I had to meet with the South Korean, and then tell. Finally, by the second meeting, we got that they were willing to all sit in the same room and talk. There was a lot of tension between Japanese and South Koreans for historical reasons, which you probably understand. But we finally got that going very well. And that ended up being a very successful process. In Japan and South Korea, as Philip knows, they call it the Perry process. Uh, we don't call it that in the United States because we're not, we, we don't think that way. But in any event, they thought it was very important because it was the United States showing respect for their country, treating them as equals, and issues which, of course, they had equal interest, at least equal interest to our own interest. So that was all very, good, very good. That was, I think, that was the reason that they presented me with this wonderful Japanese the order of the rising. Order, order, whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> What about Commodore, your relation? Or the rising sun, maybe. So it was, uh, but in general, you, one must show respect to other countries you're dealing with. And you might dislike something about them. You might like to dislike a lot, something in their history. But you have a current problem you're working on. You have to show respect for them if you want them to deal with you on a straightforward basis. And it didn't hurt that you have a blood relation to Commodore Perry. Really? 
as you tell some of these stories, it's, it was an interesting evolution, certainly partly due to you and your particular talents, that the Secretary of Defense was playing a number of the roles that you played. Typically, diplomacy has been the province of the State Department, but it's very clear that in your relationships with many countries, from the former Soviet countries to European countries to Japan while you were secretary, you were essentially a major diplomatic presence for the United States. In addition to all of your other skills and talents in science and business and so on, uh, was that a new phenomenon during your era as secretary, the role of the Secretary of Defense more in negotiating and, and uh, bringing other countries' leaders closer together with the U.S.? You know, Gloria, I think during the Cold War, it wasn't necessary for the Secretary of Defense to do diplomatic things or to even have any, even consort with the Secretary of State. We had very clear roles and very clear delineations of role, but now that the Cold War is over, we have all these countries out there, all that wanted to deal with and work with the United States, and many of them, the, prin the principal contact actually through the military. Uh, all of the Eastern European countries, when they were freed from the Warsaw Pact, and many of the republics in the former Soviet Union, when they were freed, when they became independent, the first thing they wanted was to, to develop a strong relationship with the U.S. military. So I, you know, I traveled in three years. It's, 600,000 miles, visited Albania two times, <laughs> Croatia three times. I mean, countries you'd, you'd think would be relatively insignificant. We were bringing them into NATO. I mean, not, well, that did not, we were bringing them into close working with the Western security. I did not favor bringing them into NATO. We created something called the Partnership for Peace, which gave them a basis for working with the U.S. military without becoming NATO members. The difference in the NATO is you have this article provision which says you will come to each other's defense in the case of an attack. It's a very different situation. But working with them in a cooperative way uh, in joint peacekeeping forces, for example, was, was a very good thing to do. But it involved my getting to a lot of countries a lot of times. What other countries did you feel you developed a particularly strong relationship with and do you think are extremely important to the U.S.? What countries did you, other countries, did you work, particularly work with, and fe do you feel are most important to the U.S. to have a good relationship with those countries? Well, I thought South Korea was, was immensely important. We had, at the time, I think 40,000 troops there facing North Korea across the line. North Korea had about a million troops. North Korea had an army twice as, here's a North Korea country with 20 million people, has an army twice the size of the American army. So <laughs> that makes South Korea very nervous. And so we had our 30, 40,000 troops there, not enough to stop a million man army, but enough to serve as the trigger for the rest of the American forces to come in. And the fact that we had our forces there as a triggering was very comforting to South Korea. Um, Germany, of course, is immensely important, not only from an economic point of view, which is quite obvious, but also from a military point of view. They, uh, they used to be on the, f on the front line in the facing the Soviet Union, so to speak, and the Warsaw Pact. But now they still play a, a very critical role uh, United Kingdom is the United Kingdom. I mean, we, it's, it's, it's a great nation, and we have wonderful relationships with them. And Japan, and I think what's remarkable about Japan is that from the bloody, bitter war we fought with Japan, that we've come to a place now where, where they are one of our strongest allies. And I think that's a remarkable development in, in modern politics the nations that were bitterly opposed and fighting each other are now allies and working together cooperatively. Well, it's time for our last question, and I want to return to the nuclear question. Um, and this is one of our audience members. It isn't just 
typical Americans who are unaware of the nuclear weapons problem. When the current group of presidential candidates were asked what the most serious problem facing America was, only one, and there's an asterisk here, H. Clinton, mentioned the nuclear threat. How do you get on their radar? Uh, that, that's a very good question. It's, it's hard to do that during the primary process, which I think is, has become dysfunctional. But <laughs> I would almost rather they not discuss nuclear issues. For <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. We, I, I would can just say, imagine though, Donald Trump. <laughs> two, two campaigns ago, when the two candidates, not the primary, but in the election, were asked that question, they said the greatest pro problem facing the nation today is the danger of nuclear terrorism. That was McCain and Obama. They both came ahead of that conclusion. So I don't despair altogether, but I do despair of our, prim of our primary process. Well, on that note, <laughs> I'd like to express our thanks to Robin Perry, and to Dr. William Perry, former U.S. Secretary of Defense, author of the new memoir, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink. And not only thank you for being with us here tonight, thank you for a wonderful book, thank you for a wonderful project to try to educate young people about this uh, threat to which uh, Dr. Perry has uh, committed his life to solving this threat. And I would like to thank you for your extraordinary service over decades to the United States and to the world community. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned.